in the spring of uh, 1941. So I came here as a, I was born in January of 1941, so I was about six months old. And uh, I'm pretty sure I probably came the first time in with my mother, Eleanor, AKA Susie Steinbach. And it was probably to visit my father who was at the time would have had a lab space, bench space in Old Main. My father and mother both liked Woods Hole. They had come here uh, right after they got married. In fact, they only got married because L. V. Halbrun let it be known that he would not welcome them as a couple unless they were married. So they were married after about three months of courtship in Chicago and uh, then came out to Woods Hole where Burr had already come as uh, L. V. Halbrun's postdoctoral student. So we got to live in a little house right on Yale Pond. It's, it's been rebuilt, but it's right across from the MBL on a small point of land in Eel Pond. But then, uh, but then I came back a lot of times. So when we were kids, that we came every year, except one year during the war, we didn't. And I don't remember which year it was, but it, my guess it would have been 19, about 1944, 45, probably. Well, the, uh, it's because it was actually a restricted area, like many coastal areas, and uh, the, as near as I can gather, in between doing a few experiments, uh, Burr, my father, uh, spent the summer with a friend cruising around with a, a single depth charge on the back of one of the MBL motorboats, which the idea was they were supposed to, if they spotted a submarine, they were supposed to cruise over it and drop, throw the depth charge off, I guess, uh, and, and be blown out of the water themselves. It sounded pretty, pretty uh, scatty, but uh, that was part of the plan. So they used some of the MBL boats. As you probably know, there were spotter stations built on the Elizabeth Islands. They're still there. You can find most of them. And so they, they mobilized Hui for sure. And uh, also the MBL and fisheries were kind of mobilized for the war effort. Well, at that point, they kept the fish um, in critter, critters, uh, mainly in, in uh, tanks, in, not tanks, but net cages on the dock. Eel Pond was probably pretty polluted, but it didn't make as much difference, I guess, at that point. And so you could go down to the dock, and there were, most of them were open, you know, just with a simple wooden latch. And you could unlatch it and pull up the top and look at what was in there, you know. And, and then there were some that were locked because they were, belonged to particular investigators, and they didn't want them disturbed. But you could look through the cracks and see what was in there. And, uh, and then there was one that was locked, and you couldn't see through the cracks, and that was Doc Hilton's private stash of uh, tautog. He and my grandfather, when my grandfather visited, used to go fishing for tautog out in the hole. But Doc Hilton was the, the guy on the, in charge of the marine resources. There was always, Jim McGinnis was always upstairs, really in charge. But he was the white collar more in charge, you know. Doc was the guy with the cigar clamped in his mouth with the big rubber gloves on that you talked to if you really wanted to get dead squid for bait or if you wanted to get something done. He was no longer, he was dead by the time I actually worked in supply department, but I sure remember it as a kid. I had actually uh, already by that time begun to work with the director here to run programs and I was working as a scientist here before he became the director. So um, Phil Armstrong was the director during most of the time that I was uh, working for MBL. Uh, but then when I started, once I got to Rockefeller doing my PhD work, uh, I started writing you know, Woods Hole into what I was doing too. And so, um, when I, and then I ran a program called the Frontiers in Research and Teaching, which was a really well-intentioned effort by uh, NSF, I think, to uh, bring African-American scientists uh, from their home institutions and help them get introduced to neurobiology. So there would, we would recruit more neurobiologists of color. And uh, Jim Ebert was uh, medical, the medical director at that point. But with my dad, um, for one thing, I had, a, I think, a really good relationship with him. He's one of my heroes. I mean, no question about it. He was where I learned almost everything I know about human relations and how to run meetings in a civil way. And um, the thing I remember most about him was that uh, the, uh, the Clearwater, uh, uh, Pete Seeger's sloop from the Hudson River project uh, was cruising along the coast and um, the word got out that it was going to be in town and um, someone ahead had tried to ask for space and there there was no space at Dyer's Dock, the steamship company wouldn't do it, and the oceanographic for whatever reason 
declined to have the boat tie up there. And so Burr immediately, um, you know, really spur of the moment, the boat was kind of sh coming into the harbor, um, opened up the MBL dock, which there was a secondary dock that's now occupied by uh, Chip Schultz's tug on one side and then by the Sequest or whatever it's called, Sea Adventure. But that was at the time used uh, mostly for the uh, squid boat. And Burr arranged for that side of the dock to get emptied out so that the, you know, that the clear water could come in. There was a huge party about it and celebration. But I just, I liked his ability to spontaneously accommodate what turned out to be, of course, for MBL, a really advantageous political thing to do too, because it made all the newspapers. So he was really good at finding out those kind of stuff. It's, it's hard to be brief about it, but, um, but just because he did a lot of different things. But the paper that sums it up was actually published in, um, in I think it's what's called Perspectives in Biology. I'm not sure. It was the University of Chicago publication. But anyway, he entitled it The Ubiquity of K, which stands for potassium, of course. And that's really what his scientific life was about. He, he along with a number of other people, um, took off from the the biochemistry of the 1930s, the 20s and 30s, largely led by Germans, um, but also internationally, but certainly not, there wasn't much going on in the United States. Um, and they took it in different directions. Lab Prosser took it into comparative physiology and really kind of pioneered that field. Um, Burr, along with um, a number of other people, took the biochemistry, and rather than doing pure biochemistry, they began to want to study this, really, the cell biology, the way that membranes work. At the time when he started, there were still plenty of people who felt that membranes encapsulated a bit of the ocean or something like that, or the developmental part, and they, they were pretty impermeable. Stuff didn't get across them. The cells were really like made out of saran wrap that nothing much happened. And Burr was convinced that that didn't explain the phenomena he was seeing in terms of excitability, along with a lot of other people. And so he wanted to study the membranes and how things passed across them. And by happenstance, because of the development of the bomb and the uh, Fermi's pile, uh, he, there was suddenly a lot of radioactive elements around, short-term isotopes that would decay with a certain rate, potassium and sodium being among them. What that meant was that they could take the old bulk studies and uh, then actually trace across the membrane using radioactive isotopes what the rate of flow of, of potassium and sodium across the membrane. But it was difficult to do because cells aren't big enough to do that, except for one cell, the giant squid cell axon. And so the discovery, Young's discovery in, um, over in Naples of the giant squid axon in, the rapid uh, accumulation of knowledge about that and the discovery that squid here would work. Um, and then Casey Cole's work on the electrical properties of this meant that they could actually do work on this terrific cell and do both the bulk studies where you actually analyzed it and also the radioactive tracers. And that's really why Woods Hole was so convenient for him in terms of his science. He studied other animals, and he studied potassium distribution, and he studied other aspects of things. But that was really the core of his scientific work. So when did about MDL, though, which was true to the original uh, group of Agassiz, Whitman, and the rest who started it, was that it really should serve individuals, that the purpose was to promote individuals' creativity, and rather than corporate things. And by that I mean the same group, for example, even, and who originally had been involved in the fisheries, many of them, even as they were starting MBL, they recognized that HUI needed to come into existence, because you, they recognized you couldn't do real significant oceanography without big money and big boats at ocean, and the oceanographic would have to be different than MBL which it is. Um, but I think as long as the MBL sticks with that mission, he'd be pleased with it. And that really does mean to me is, um, is really embodied in two, two quotes that are up on the wall. One is the famous one, you know, study nature, not books. That's true. But then the one that's framed over marine resources, you know, seeing what everybody has already seen and thinking what nobody has thought, attributed to Albert St. Georgie, is uh, really something that MBL is good at and 
should be good at, and that's the core value that, that, that what MBL means to me. And how do you do that? Well, at one point you did it by having a library that you could walk into from anywhere, if you got here, anywhere in the world could just walk into the library and have access to the best biological science that's available. And so emulating that electronically and trying to keep that as a possibility would be a, a really important goal of mine, that, that MBL would be allow equal access. It would be a, a strong defender of the idea of trying to improve everyone's access to science as well as doing the science. And how do you do the science? Well, you, you, you keep on getting new people and you stay open to new ideas and you don't turn someone down just because they're, it kind of sounds weird or maybe it wouldn't work. You really try to support that type of thinking and you try to nurture it and you keep on having classes. And the idea of uh, amalgamating with Chicago and having more students from different, and different times of year, I think that can be spread into the whole year. I really think that MBL could be that type of support for science as a creative activity that requires collaboration but is not based on institutional directions.